Caterina Benincasa, whom we all know today as St. Catherine of Siena, closed her eyes to this world and opened them to eternity on April 29th, 1380, exactly 640 years ago tomorrow in Rome. She was 33 years of age, just as Christ was at the time of his death and resurrection. For us here at St. Catherine's, our patronal feast day will always in the future be associated also with St. John Vianney, because it was one year ago tomorrow and the next day that the incorrupt heart of the patron saint of all priests was brought here to this parish church and rested on this altar. Throngs of people filled the church for the mass celebrated by Archbishop Cronin, and they prayed throughout the night in the presence of the heart of the cure of ours, a heart untouched by time. When St. John Vianney's heart was here on St. Catherine's Day last year, I thought to myself that although I'm not entirely sure what conversations among the saints in heaven look like or sound like, I think we can all confidently suppose that if St. Catherine of Siena and St. John Vianney crossed paths on that day, the word Nichols very likely came up in their conversation. Statues of both of these saints stand in our sanctuary. Relics of both of them are sealed within our altar of sacrifice. In the Litany of Saints, which is chanted at ordinations and church consecrations and other important events in the life of the church, the name of St. John Vianney immediately precedes that of St. Catherine of Siena as the church invokes them and asks them to come to our aid. Yet one year ago, on the joyful day of the visit here of the heart of St. John Vianney on our patronal feast day, so soon after the consecration of our church, which had taken place the previous month, we never could have imagined the circumstances which would mark our celebration of this, our patronal feast day, one year later. So it is helpful for us to remember that the circumstances in which St. Catherine herself lived were far from easy. In many ways, her life was different from our own. From a young age, her relationship with God, with Our Lady and with the saints was truly mystical. Her biographer records that her first mystical vision of Jesus occurred when she was just five or six years old. For many years in her adult life, she survived on the Eucharist alone, eating nothing else. She bore the stigmata, the wounds of the crucified Christ on her body. Only she could see it until her death, but after her death, the wounds became visible to everyone. In her lifetime, St. Catherine delivered many people from diabolical possession. She performed numberless miracles she even levitated sometimes when she was deep in prayer. The 14th century in which she lived was a time of chaos, both in her native Italy and in the church itself. And because of her reputation for holiness and miracles, she was asked to arbitrate, heal, and rectify many disputes and scandals, which she did both by personal visits and by over 400 letters she wrote to kings and prelates. St. Catherine of Siena burned with zeal for peace and for truth, so she was very successful in healing old feuds and settling differences and restoring many rebellious Italian cities to peace and communion with the Holy See. It can fairly be said that St. Catherine of Siena had one of the most vibrant and remarkable personalities of all the saints in the entire history of the church, and by the sheer force of her personality, many people were converted to Christ. Even people who were hardened by years of cynicism toward the things of God were converted just by seeing her, just by meeting her. And her influence was so powerful that at one time, three Dominican priests had to be assigned just to hear the confessions of people that she convinced to repent 
and make a good confession. Most famously of all, she was instrumental in convincing Pope Gregory XI to move the papacy from its self-imposed exile in Avignon in France back to Rome, the city of the blessed apostles Peter and Paul. And there the popes remain to this day. But even if all this seems far removed from our experience of the faith, you and I do have some things in common with our patroness. First of all, we, like St. Catherine, are baptized. And because of that, we are, just as she was, adopted sons and daughters of the living God. That's the most important thing of all. St. Catherine accomplished all she did, not because she was wealthy, because she wasn't, not because she had an influential post in the church, because she didn't, but because she understood her own dignity as the dignity of one who had been claimed by Christ in baptism. Along with this, she also understood her mission, which she received at baptism, just as you and I did, the mission to live the truth and to proclaim Christ not only by her words, but also by her very life. And this year especially, it is important for us to remember that St. Catherine also lived through a time of pandemic when the Black Plague struck Siena in 1374. In her writings from that period, St. Catherine makes clear, and this is important for us to ponder these days, she makes clear in her understanding of the gospel that pain and suffering do not have the final word. Pain and suffering do not have the final say in our lives. Rather, as St. Catherine would tell us, when in our prayer, we intentionally unite our sufferings with those of Christ on the cross. Our pain or suffering of whatever kind, physical pain, psychological pain, emotional pain, pain at seeing the sufferings of others, our sufferings are of whatever kind are transformed by Christ into a means by which God sanctifies us and redeems us. And that can happen precisely because of our baptism in which you and I were incorporated into Christ, into his life, his sufferings, his death, his resurrection. When St. Catherine witnessed the devastation of the plague all around her in Siena, she tended very compassionately to the victims of the plague. But she insisted on the point that suffering of itself only destroys. But even the pain of illness, any form of suffering, can become a means of grace when the one who suffers unites it intentionally to Christ, turns it into a means of clinging intentionally to the crucified Lord. St. Catherine's point in her writings was not so much to focus on the necessity of suffering, but to offer to people who are suffering a means to turn that pain to good for oneself and for others, not to be crushed by it, not to become embittered by it, but to be sanctified by it. As St. Catherine's fellow Dominican, St. Thomas Aquinas said, the passion of Christ is sufficient to form us in every virtue. In this regard, St. Catherine of Siena famously said, start being brave about everything. Drive out darkness and spread light. Don't look at your weaknesses. Realize instead that in Christ crucified, you can do everything. Words to live by at any time, but especially in this time. So finally, my friends, when Pope Pius II canonized St. Catherine of Siena 
on the solemnity of Saints Peter and Paul, June 29th, 1461, he said, no one ever approached her without going away better. Through the prayers of our patroness, one of the most remarkable women in the history of the church, may you and I too cooperate with God's grace in such a way that people will be able to say of us, no one ever approached her, no one ever approached him without going away better. Start being brave about everything. Drive out darkness and spread light. Don't look at your weaknesses. Realize instead that in Christ crucified, you can do everything. With St. Catherine's prayers, let's begin. <laughs> 